Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am going to be your host, Graveraham. Ah, and I'm going to be your host, Inshane Spiker. <laughs> that was good. I like that one. Yeah, that was okay. It was better than Kardashian, which is a weird <laughs> thing. And yeah, what are you doing, Google? Come on. Hey, come on, tighten up. So we're a psychology podcast, which may or may not seem obvious at this point. We like to talk about all sorts of things related to psychology, which, as it turns out, is most of what humans do. Every year during the month of October, we like to celebrate creepy things by talking about creepy topics. And we decided we were going to close out this year's creepy topic fest by burying it. Yes. Burying this topic in the ground. Bury your... I can't do the thing. It's a band. (laughs) It's a band song. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> it's also a band, there's, there's a band called bury your dead uh-huh and their lyrics about They're it and songs about it, all kinds of fun stuff anyway as i said we're talking <laughs> about this sort of thing today and particularly why we bury our dead what is the history of this practice where does it come from what does it mean and talk about that sort of thing you know as mark twain noted the only certainties in life are death and taxes <laughs> i mean thanks to offshore bank accounts and tax loopholes for the uber rich now it's just death but <laughs> yeah i don't think he planned for uh the caymans right yeah all the things that have come out recently that jeff bezos doesn't pay taxes and so many of these people paid very little or nothing in taxes yeah and jeff bezos is now suing nasa over the moon so you know real real stand-up guy sure why not that guy oh god somebody should bury him not dead <laughs> bury your alive <laughs> bury your alive i'm not dead yet <laughs> no not dead yet Bring out your dead. No dead yet. <laughs> Love. What a great, what a great movie. So maybe the only certainties in life are death and Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's where we're moving. We're moving to the singularity. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. no. So when did this practice start? 5,000 BCE, ancient Egypt? Nope. Much further back. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. We're so excited about that. Yeah. So uh, humans have been digging holes in the ground to fill with bodies of other humans for over 100,000 years. <laughs> so someone should ask Joe Biden about his stories of the very first burials because he was there. Ah, <laughs> We're full of jokes. We're full of jokes today. Now, when you're going that far back in history, you still had other hominids that were not the species of Homo sapiens that we currently that we are all that's left. There were other Homo whatever species and Neanderthals and that sort of thing. So what we're looking at is, did we see anything that looked like burial practices anywhere in, in that record? And what's important to begin with here is understanding what we're even talking about and, and what a grave or a burial is. So a grave specifically is an excavation made in the earth in which to bury the dead. Now that sounds straightforward, but what's important is what's implied in this And what it says is it's made in the earth in which to bury the dead, meaning that the excavation was made for a purpose. Mm -hmm. The body that was ending up in the hole was intentional. It had some sort of intention behind it. So that's an important piece of this as we talk about what even qualifies as burial, because you might, you might start to bring up the caveat. What about someone who there was like a sinkhole that they fell in? Their body might be under the ground where they buried. Right. What if someone like pushed someone off of a cliff and they fell and then a landslide went on top of them? That person kind of buried that other person, but were they burying them, you know, in the sense of what we talk about in, right. in this? Yeah, these don't qualify as graves. Like simply throwing a body into a pit to remove the smell or to avoid attracting predators isn't really in the purview of what a grave is. And so there's there's like specific practices, specific traditions, specific rituals that go along with what constitutes a grave and that whole process. Right. Archaeologists looking around, they might find a skeleton in the dirt. It doesn't mean that it was buried. It may have coincidentally ended up up there, or so the mafia say. (laughs) We know your tricks, Capone. (laughs) That's the first mafia person I could think of. I don't know why. Fair. Now, how would an archaeologist determine whether a burial was intentional? Well, they might look for indications that the placement of the body was symbolic such as finding useful things buried with the body, such as tools or relics that could have come to some cultural meaning. So there's some kind of indication that there was, it was planned really is what they're trying to find. Yeah. Specifically because there would, you would, you might find things there that shouldn't just be with a body. Right. Under most normal circumstances. So, okay. There was what someone believed to be one of the first burials. And this is in 1960. There's a cave in Iraq and French archaeologists discovered this cave with several Neanderthal skeletons inside it that seemed to be buried. 
and this dated back more than 35,000 years. So they're thinking in the 1960s, maybe this is the first example of burial. Now, it's important also about this, and one of the reasons that they were thinking this was a burial, because again, it could have just been that they were in there. You know, maybe they had right. a disease and they just got stuck or something. Right. But what they found is that they were accompanied by pollen. And so they were thinking that at first, the archaeologists believed that the pollen that they found with the bodies was from flowers that were placed with the bodies because loved ones had buried those bodies with flowers. They're all excited. They go and present their findings and whatnot. Unfortunately, there's a wrinkle. So this appeared to be a monumental discovery, implying that for the first time ever that Neanderthals had come to some complex social patterns and abstract thoughts. So this was kind of a pre-planned thing, they thought. However, yeah. it was soon discovered that the pollen had been carried in by opportunistic rodents. So also, we have evidence of intentional burial going back much further than that anyway. So this wasn't going to be the earliest. There's some wrinkles in it. We're going to look at those older examples anyway. Yeah, so unfortunately that cave is out, but we do have plenty of other examples. Now, there are three primary locations where they were looking for potentially, let me rephrase that, they found evidence, there were bodies there, and they had they were candidates for being the first burial sites that we had ever discovered. That doesn't mean that they were the first ever, but the first that had ever been discovered and described. So the bodies would have been buried as far back as 50,000 or even 400,000 BCE. And these are the contenders for the earliest burial site. So a long way yes. back there. Very, very old. Very, very old. So first in Atapuerca, Spain, rail workers accidentally uncovered a cave and informed the local archaeologist. The archaeologist found a large hole in the cave that was filled with animal bones. But underneath that was several hominid bones belonging to an early hominid that evolved alongside the Neanderthals for a while. There was no evidence that the bones had been carried in by the flood or mistakenly ended up there due to a collapse in the cave or anything like that. And all the animal bones were on top of the hominid bones, meaning that the people were there first. But why were they there? Perhaps there were bodies of those who were died from illness. They might have been that. And the family had put them there to avoid spreading disease. Perhaps due to the smell or wanting to avoid predators, they had buried them and maybe care like covered them with other animals. There's a lot of different things that could have happened. But they did find this skeleton underneath all the other skeletons. Right. And several skeletons. And and this was a hole that was pretty deep. Like you weren't easily going to get out of that hole. So it didn't make sense that the predators brought the bones in there. Right. It, it would have made sense that they were attracted to the smell and then they couldn't get out again. I mean, that's maybe why they ended up in there. Yeah. And you might be thinking, hey, you said it didn't count if they were buried to remove the smell. And that's true. And that's actually why this d was disputed as a, an actual burial site by most modern definitions. They dubbed this site the Pit of Bones, which, side note, great band name yes absolutely for metal bands specifically probably not a great indie band yeah this is not gonna like... see pit of bones tour with vampire weekend <laughs> right so because of this this is not considered to be an actual burial site now the second rising star cave is in Huateng, a uh, province in south africa which is thought to be about two hundred and fifty thousand years old that's a pretty that's a pretty old old cave yeah for sure so, similar to the Pit of Bones, the cave did not indicate that the bodies were carried there by floodwaters or happened to end up there due to collapse. These also weren't modern humans, but another species similar to humans. And distinct from the Pit of Bones, there were no animals at all and only 15 bodies. The bodies ranged from infant to adult and were placed there over time. And some archaeologists think that this, is, this constitutes intentional placement. But many argue there isn't enough evidence to call this a burial site. So, the beauty of, like, arguing about things that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. I love this. I love like that. There's like a discourse on that. Right. Yeah. We're they're You know, they're, they're sort of making up some arbitrary rules, but they, and they're not, I guess not completely arbitrary. They're not without merit. Yeah. So we have two sites, neither of them really meeting our definition of burial, at least not consistently enough to feel confident in calling that a burial site. Yeah. The third site we have is in Kafza cave, and this is in Mount precipice, Israel. And the remains found there dated to, I saw between 92 and 100,000 years ago. So somewhere in there. Okay. In there, they found 15 bodies of actual Homo sapiens. They were actually like a little bit before Homo sapiens, but like the immediate lineage to Homo sapiens. Yeah. And it consisted of adults and children. So here's some of the features that were unique about this particular arrangement. First, they found things like flint tools, seashells, and then there was this red clay called ochre. Mm-hmm. 
and the skeletons were buried in what appeared to be an orderly fashion. They kind of were like they're oriented in a specific direction. They were spaced apart and somewhat evenly. Two of them were buried with deer horns in their hands. Some bones were covered in that red ochre clay, meaning they had applied it. And this was a clay that was used for cave paintings. It was believed to have some religious significance. And furthermore, the red ochre actually continued to grow in prominence in, in cultures after this. But even more importantly for our story today, it grew more popular during more well-documented burial practices. So as burials became more commonly practiced in culture, you actually saw a lot more of this red clay implying that perhaps this was an early practice that began to be carried out. So the earliest instance of, of what is probably burial is probably this one. This is our this is our winner. Yeah. Is the Kafza cave in Mount Precipice, Israel. Yeah. I mean, this one has all the indicators that they have kind of set up as those like the like clear indicators that this is probably right. the thing. The other two are iffy enough that they can't really confirm it. This one definitely has that. So then you ask the question, why? Why are we burying people? And there are a lot of practical reasons that we mentioned, right? To avoid odor, to prevent transmission of disease, to avoid the bodies attracting predators, but also there were religious and cultural significance in these practices. What people thought about what happens to our bodies when we die. And what you'll find is that there's a lot of that in our current practices. It's pretty interesting. And actually that whole avoiding disease thing may have been misinformed. We discussed that a little bit in the previous episode on what makes things creepy yeah. and uh, the plague masks and that sort of thing. But anyway, for the most part, what we have really seen is that these burial practices, they're an acknowledgement of death. And it, it really shows the intention is to show respect for the dead. It can provide a last look at the body for the family or the loved ones of the deceased. It honors any religious or cultural practices that could, you know, they could be secular practices as well. But yeah, that's that's really what it seems to be set up to do is to provide that kind of last acknowledgement of that that person's life up to that point and then a sort of send off. Yeah, absolutely. So arguably, the rituals that accompany the final placement of the remains is psychologically important for the people that have lost the loved one. So it's a step in the process for those folks to be able to accept their loss by making a parting gift for their loved ones and symbolically letting them go with the best possible circumstances. So they're able to kind of celebrate that person. They're able to see them off into the afterlife and all in all those things and really kind of just say one final goodbye. So it seems to be more important for the living than it is for the dead. Yeah, it's definitely this step in the grieving process to help people feel, I think, more complete and able to accept the situation as it is, you know, by sort of honoring the the passing of the loved one. Yeah. There are some other specific practices. We're going to talk about some of the cultures around the world, what they have historically done and why they did it. And that also leads to sort of that part of the contemporary practice around burials comes from old traditions that we may not necessarily have the same motives. We nevertheless carried on many of the same practices. So for example, in ancient Mesopotamia, Sumerians believe that the afterlife was located underneath the earth. And so the dead were placed in the earth as a closer, they're in closer proximity to the next phase of their existence. So their sort of final journey as they bury them down so they can continue on down to the afterlife. Yeah, logically, that makes sense. If that's your belief system, right? Yeah, sure. The Egyptians famously built elaborate chambers for housing their dead, specifically their elite. So you didn't see that a lot for like the everyday folks. You wouldn't see a lot of like large pyramids for John, your neighbor or anything like that. (laughs) You know, the commoners were actually buried underground in simpler graves. And so to add insult to injury, they were also buried with the tools that they used in their life to help them with their chores in the afterlife. So there's no like there's that whole phrase where there's no rest for the wicked. Yeah. But there's also like, you know, you'll sleep when you're dead. Well, here they're like, nah, you still got some, <laughs> you still got some fields to till. You've still got some stuff to do. So you're going to go ahead. Here's your here's your implements. Go on to the afterlife. That's right. With your job. You'll be a slave forever if I have anything to say about it. Well past the point of your death. Yeah. Real, real. That's just mean. <laughs> now. I didn't talk about this much later in my preparation for this, but the whole idea of the sarcophagi, sarcophagus, and these sort of large stone burial chambers, which were actually very good at preserving the dead in in many respects, although they did have their sort of time in the sun, as you can imagine, they waned with popularity, not only because it was a weird thing to do, because it was like, you know, 
you're <laughs> creating this huge stone thing to store body in, but it's expensive and they took up a lot of space. Yeah. Right. Like it, we just keep making more people and the dead aren't going anywhere. So like if we insist on keeping them all in one place, like we're going to run out of space in not too short a period of time, yeah. particularly in like the history of the world. So we don't live all that long and we're making a lot of people. So, well, <laughs> And arguably, arguably at the time we were living less longer. So it would have meant that there was yeah. more like, I mean, like what uh, was it? Tut was only like 16. Oh, man. I didn't know or, that. It, either Tut or Ramsey's one of the really popular ones was yeah was like only 16 when he passed and like also had like a club foot and like had like a bunch of like deformities from incest, too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Not a glamorous life to be a pharaoh. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> we do have the Egyptians to thank in part for helping to create marked gravestones. I did find some sources that indicated that marking a burial spot was probably something that had been practiced for a long time. But the the Egyptians are also credited with sort of having specific grave markers. And actually, similar to the mess to the Sumerians, the Greeks showed a high amount of respect for their dead. They also used and sort of borrowed from the Egyptians the marking of gravestones, but they also believed that similar again, bringing back to the Sumerians, they believed that burying them underground placed them nearer to the afterlife. So you had sort of Tartarus and Hades and, and all that were underground. Yeah. That placing them in the ground then brought them closer to their afterlife. Yeah. Now the Mayans also followed similar traditions. However, they believed the dead must navigate a passage to the afterlife, which was filled with demons. So to aid their dead in making this journey, the Mayans carefully arranged the bodies pointing either north or west and sprinkled them with red mineral shavings. So that was designed to kind of help protect them and aid them into their uh, journey through the demon spaces. Yeah. And I, I think that the way that I wrote that made it sound like the afterlife is filled with demons. It was the passage that was filled with demons. Right. The after, they wanted to get to the afterlife. There was so. another journey to get to the afterlife. And that was the treacherous journey. Right. Now, the Romans were very interesting. They took burials very seriously. People were effectively taxed. I mean, they didn't call it that, but they were effectively taxed to pay for a monthly burial subscription service. <laughs> not unlike Paramount Plus. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> I decided on one to throw some shade at. <laughs> I don't actually think it's it Paramount Plus. Yeah, yeah, it works. And anyway, with the subscription service came a funeral procession that would carry the dead outside of city walls. It was very specific. The dead had to be carried outside the city during the night and then burned or entombed, mostly burned. And so then that, they would do this whole thing, this sort of ritualistic burning of the people. Now, they also did... In the first century, they, they built these things called columbariums, or also called devocotes. And this is a structure that contained multiple urns, where they would stack these urns full of the ashes of their dead. So they also had these urns, again, this is you know 1000 BC, and they were these, these metal vessels that would contain the cremains of people. They were made of clay, they were then later made of metal, but yeah, these are, are things that you would find in these, these large mausoleum type things interesting stuff like it's, it's always interesting to see kind of how people handle this stuff differently so yeah ireland and scotland also have some of the oldest burial traditions going back as far as 4000 bce so they originally buried their dead in cairns and dolmens and positioned their dead in accordance with astrological beliefs they were early adopters of wooden coffins and frequently buried their dead with important personal possessions and items of religious significance so that's translated into what you'll see a lot of today in the united states at least now, the Abrahamic religions also had some unique and distinct sort of funeral rites practices. So Jewish and Muslim traditions usually inter the body very quickly. Mm -hmm. And specifically, Jewish tradition prefers the bodies and similarly to how they began, meaning without any modifications, piercings, tattoos, that sort of thing. Muslims would specifically orient the body so the head was pointed toward Mecca. And again, they're trying to get them in the ground pretty quickly. Now, Christians and other religions, they tend to take days or even weeks to finally bury their dead. So long, you know, a lot of preparation for these, you might call them celebrations or other festivities, activities that pertains to the passage of life into the afterlife. Now, Vikings, because of course we have to talk about Vikings and Viking funerals and stuff like that. Yeah, why wouldn't we? Yeah, why wouldn't we? Because that's like, you want to talk about metal. Yeah. Vikings didn't actually set the boats on fire with their loved ones and leaders. They did create a special boat like burial plot that they, they would use for their folks. And instead, it was very important for them to burn the body in the hottest fire they could create. So the belief was that the hotter the fire, the higher the smoke rose, 
the more likely the people were to make it to Valhalla. So that that was a lot of the tradition around that. It wasn't necessarily they were just like setting boats on fire and sending them into other ports and stuff. Right. That just seems like a dangerous practice. And also kind of a waste, like, you know, making a boat was not like an easy thing. It was pretty labor intensive and required a lot of materials. So, yeah, they'd build these things that were called like a tumulus and they more or less looked sort of boat shaped burial plot thing. Yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of cool feature there. So then with that, let's talk about what Americans do, because we have to know a little bit about what this looks like today. What does a burial practice look like today in the United States? Yeah, and in the United States is I think you could broadly classify it as a Christian country for the most part. A lot of evidence to support that that's mostly the the way that it's set up. But you know, modern practices aside, funerals are expensive. Yeah. Particularly when you're burying your dead. So we're talking on average, or actually on a minimum, a minimum of like ten to twelve thousand dollars for a funeral. And this is right. actually from a, about four years ago. Then I can imagine that it's only gone up. I love that video. Also references the kiss casket, which if yeah. you are not, if you're not familiar with the kiss casket, it is an airbrushed casket that you can be buried in. It's like it's like spray paint. It's like covered in kiss merchandise, and you can buy it now because it can double as a beer cooler until you until you need to be buried. Yeah, but it runs at least seven grand, and and there's no no telling whether or not it comes with the amps that they advertise it yeah. as being perched atop. Also, Gene Simmons is the worst, so don't buy it. Yeah, there's that too. <laughs> now, some of the funeral industry also has been accused of engaging in some predatory business practices. This is tacking a lot of unnecessary add-ons to a funeral, having mandatory processes like mandatory embalming, even if that's not something that you want to have happen. There was some class action lawsuits, I think that won, that accused them of price fixing. So they got together to sort of artificially inflate the price of caskets and maintain it at a really high price, much higher than was needed to cover the costs and still make a profit. And so those are some of the the things that exist in this industry. Did I ever tell you about the time I almost ended up working in a funeral home? I don't think so. I was looking for another job. I was not happy where I was at. And there was this really great want ad that said, do you like helping people apply here? And I just left a phone number. <laughs> That's so vague. It's so vague. And so at first I'm like, I call the number. They don't express who they are. I'm like, yeah, I saw this ad. And this is like me being naive. Like I could have been like driven to a warehouse and gotten murdered. Yeah. I'd say this is something creepy. Jared left that ad in the newspaper. Yeah. It was like, real weird. You can come help me, boy. So I call, they give me an address. I show up at this time and I pull up into a funeral home. And I'm like, there is no way that this is what it is. There is no way that this was the ad they put in. And I walk in and it was, and I was like, I can't work here. I'm I, and I left it. But so I almost ended up interviewing to work at a funeral home based on a very vague ad. Wow. Yeah. So fun things. What a practice for them. Yeah. It's very, very strange. So Anyway, it was just a, a weird one. So that's, I guess it speaks to the idea of like those predatory practices, like how they just get people in and work and then like you're a salesman. That's essentially what it was for us to be a salesman. Oh, yeah. They're like the anglerfish business trying yeah. to lure you in. Like, yeah, I love bite your head people. Off. I'm like, who? And I was like, wait, who am I helping at yeah. this point in time? Just the mortician, I guess. Like, this is not helpful. Yeah. So a single plot for burial is 32 square feet of land. So that's a lot of land and resource just for one body. Yeah. And so there's, uh, we're getting now into the section of all of the environmental problems with the modern burial. I mean, we've talked about some of the ethical problems and the financial issues with these burials, but yeah, so 32 square feet of land, the concrete used for burial vaults and tombstones and whatnot we go through enough of that to lay a two a two lane highway that would cross half of the United States per year per year. So in two years, you could cross the United States with the amount of concrete that's used in these practices. Yeah. An average of 10 acre plots contain enough wood to build 40 homes. So that's like just wood that's just like stuck in the ground full of like bugs and stuff. Just stuck in the ground. Just stuck in the ground. Not used for anything. Just sitting there taking up space. I, I apologize. I, I'm not trying to diminish if that's if that's what your preference is and your practice. I'm not trying to diminish that. It's just it's important to understand how much resource goes into burying one person. Right. Yeah. No, it's really just thinking about like, what are the implications? What are the factors when we're thinking about this? Like it's this is just a lot like it's something to think about how much is going into this. I think it was every year we use enough formaldehyde to fill a swimming pool in just a 10 acre plot. Oh, OK, just a 10, 10 acre plot. 
And so, yeah, that's that's obviously a problem. And I'll talk more about formaldehyde here in just a moment. Yeah. And there's enough metal every year to build the Golden Gate Bridge and reconstruct it. To build the entire thing. To build the entire thing. Again, just sitting in the ground. Just there. We dug it out of the ground, smelted it into a box, put it back in the ground. Yeah. It made it gross. Because dead bodies are gross. Yeah. And spray painted Gene Simmons face on it. Yeah. Spray painted Gene Simmons face on it. I want you all to think about that for a second. <laughs> Let's talk for just a second about embalming. Obviously, if you're familiar with mummies at all, embalming is something that has been around for a long time. The primary use really is to slow the process of decomposition and preserve the body. And there are practical reasons for this, such as providing time to arrange for burial rituals, such as a funeral procession, that sort of thing. You might perhaps symbolically provide the corpse a chance to make it to the afterlife. There might be a reason people wanted to embalm bodies. And you also wanted to often pr- preserve the body so that it could be viewed by loved ones. Okay. All that being considered, this is a practice that really should end. Formaldehyde, the embalming chemical and other embalming chemicals are horribly toxic mm-hmm. and they emit harmful pollutants and they frequently end up in our water supply seemingly for the only reason that you can then look at the body a little longer and occasionally maybe reflect on that past loved one and imagine that they look similar to how you saw them last. That's it. That's the reason we're dumping yeah. thousands of gallons of toxic chemicals. And they're, I mean, they're, they're really rough, too, because they're known to be carcinogens. There's a higher rate of cancer among morticians and funeral home directors. That's like liver cancer. I think it's lung cancer as well. Okay, lung cancer. Yeah, there's like four different leukemia. There were like four different types of cancers that were at much higher rates for people who were around using embalming agents. And again, like there's really not a point, though. The point is just to keep the body in a condition a little bit longer, but then the chemicals go on for a long time. Right. Absolutely. It is not a great practice at all. It's really pointless. I mean, it's, it's really just a tremendous waste and a, a tremendous potential for damage and for like a couple of days of preservation. Right. It's, point, it's pointless for a burial practice, like a practicality of burial practice i can understand why people would want that for their loved ones if they're in the grieving process but like we have to do better with our grieving processes and the supports with our grieving processes so we can make this this practice of using embalming fluid and all that kind of obsolete the reason it's not obsolete is because we psychologically do not support grieving in a way that would allow somebody to move through that you know like there it's it's really kind of like all entangled we have to kind of separate that stuff out and we're so bad at thinking about like, well, what I want right now is what matters. Yeah. A hundred years from now, when people are dying of the toxic chemicals I had to use right now, I don't care. Right. Right now, I want this body to look good for a few hours. Right. Who would have thought that you and I had like very strong stances on burials? And embalming fluid. Embalming fluid specifically. <laughs> I did not expect us. I mean, I expected us to be on the same page about stuff like that, but did not expect yeah. that to come up. This turned into a whole thing. It did. <laughs> it did. We actually are through most of the content of this. I mean, I think, and we'll get, we'll touch on some take home points, but I do have some really interesting tidbits that I found that are kind of fun to discuss. One is this idea of meals around funerals. Okay. Most common funeral and burial practices include some sort of meal. Sometimes they're really light, like it's just coffee. Sometimes they're really big, extravagant feasts. Now, in, this was in part to ensure that the grieving family did not forego food while they're processing the grief, and particularly if the loved one was primarily responsible for acquiring money for food and that sort of thing, then having them gone could mean that they might be in a dangerous position. And so this was sort of a way to ensure that they got something to eat, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah, that makes sense. From a social standpoint, that makes perfect sense. Now, burial devices, or like maybe vessels, I guess is probably a better word, yeah. like coffins, are actually technically different than caskets. Coffins and caskets are two very different things. Yeah, and now they're mostly used interchangeably, those terms now, but technically a coffin is kind of anything you bury someone in. So any box or even container of whatever sort that you put someone in, you could call a coffin. A casket is actually a thing that is used to store precious objects, and it just sort of started getting used by like funeral directors and that, that sort of thing to describe these coffins to make them sound better than coffin. Right. And that was pretty much the only reason. But they are technically different. Now, graves were dug to be six feet during the plague to prevent spread. Spoiler alert, didn't work. <laughs> and then to prevent grave robbers, also spoiler alert, didn't work. And then out of tradition, because it just became kind of the cultural norm at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. The whole six feet thing. Interesting. Six feet comes up a lot around death yeah. and disease, I found. 
but yeah, the whole six feet thing was they're like, oh, if they're at least they have to be six feet down, then you can't catch the plague from their body. And like, well, you weren't catching the plague for their bo- from their body, so doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you're catching it from the rats, baby. Yeah. Now they did have shallow graves, and then so when a lot of medical students and like doctors and scientists were needing bodies, then grave robbers were selling them bodies that they dug up from the cemeteries. And anyone that was in a shallow grave was really easy for them to dig, and so they would get out like up to four, you know, four to six or eight, you know, bodies in a night, depending on how shallow the graves were. Mm-hmm. And so part of out of that, then they started digging those graves deeper back down to the six feet. And really, ever since then, it's just been because yeah, because we've always done it that way. Yeah, there's no magical reason for six feet. It could be it could be deeper. It could be more shallow. Doesn't it's whatever. Yeah. Another interesting one is sky burials. Have you heard of these? I have not heard of this. This is this sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it it sounds I mean, it's it's maybe not what it sounds like, but it sounds very cool. And essentially what this is, this is just laying a body out in the open on top of like a mountain or a really high place. And the point is that it's first of all, it is away from like where there are people for the most part. And it's placed there specifically to be decayed by the elements and picked over by scavengers. And so this is sort of a return it to the birds sort of situation where when you're on top of a mountain, for example, you're not really in the place where you have a ton of real estate. Right. And so you you kind of use your space sparingly and you don't want to fill it up all your available real estate with bodies. And so a very practical thing to do with those bodies is to just set it out for the animals and the elements because they will take care of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we already mentioned this before, but modern burials are intensely bad for the environment and incredibly wasteful, so much so that people are moving away from those types of modern burials. They're moving into different options and stuff like that. One example of this is Japan. Japan actually has so little available land space for its huge population that they have moved to cremation services, so much so that almost everybody there is cremated. We're talking 99.9% of the population of Japan that passes away is cremated. It's huge. And a lot of people have acknowledged that cremation also is not necessarily great for the environment. If there was embalming, then you're going to be releasing those chemicals used in the smoke. That doesn't usually happen, but it can. You have to roast the body for hours at like 1800 degrees. We're talking like lava. It's real hot. It's real hot. It's not quite as hot as lava, but it's real hot. (laughs) And so that's very, very energy intensive. You spend a lot of fuel burning a body to make it that hot, to burn it down to its its cremains. So people have, are trying other practices. There's a practice of soaking a body in water and lye, mm-hmm. and then that eats away all the flesh and all you have left is a skeleton, which sounds awesome. Uh, kind of metal, kind of cool. Probably not very what metal. the family wants, but doesn't take up very much space at that point and relatively easy to get rid of. I want that one because I want you to put my giant bones into a decoration somewhere. Like <laughs> I am a huge, huge man. So like, please like get that skeleton and prop it up somewhere funny. So there's another one called Promesian where they basically froze the body in liquid nitrogen and just shook it and t- yeah. until it like fell apart and it was like particles and then they would filter out all the the metal and all the stuff that might be in the body like from your fillings and whatnot and it would look like cremains but it was less labor intensive I think I believe they said it was like one tenth of the energy that's required for cremation was used for right. this right yeah something like that. And then finally, another one is just natural burials. I mean, when organisms die, they tend to just lay on the ground and they decompose because decomposers get to them. They get picked over by scavengers. And while most people would not be cool with that with the remains of their loved ones, if you just put someone in the ground not in a box, then you get a similar effect, right? Their body gets to decompose. It's a much greener way to do it. There's very little needed for that. You don't need a giant plot for it. It's not going to leach any toxic chemicals. It actually could potentially be good for nature in the area yeah. because the decomposers help move all the nutrients and stuff around. So those are options for people who are looking for a green burial uh, and, to, and to avoid, I mean, definitely a, a traditional burial, but uh, you might also want to avoid the cremation just because of how energy intensive it is. Yeah. You know, wherever you're at. There are also these things called ecopods that are very similar to that. They're made of like plant materials and they break down easily. So I like wicker baskets and that sort of thing. Yeah. You could buy an ecopod and it's a thin little pod they put your body in and put it in the ground. Yeah. You could wrap yourself in a sheet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be fancy. It's nice and simple. Yeah. So I mean, I don't have anything else on that then. Yeah, let's have some take home points. I guess the main take home point, why we bury our dead. I really think that more than anything, there was there was two pieces to this. One is a practical concern. 
they're unsightly, they're sad, <laughs> they smell bad, and they attract predators yeah. and other unwanted pests that you probably don't want around you or your food or your family, right? Right. So there's, there's a, practical, a practical reason to want to. The other one is a psychological reason, which is I think that going through a ritualistic procession tradition of how you deal with your past loved ones helps you accept what has happened and help you move through the grieving process by showing your respect, by showing your commitment, by paying homage to that person and really demonstrating you know, your, your commitment and love of that person in one final act, if you will. One thing I got out of this episode, too, was that there's just so many different ways to practice this and so many different rituals around this that I feel are interesting and important for understanding values of a culture. Right. And it's yeah. not necessarily it's not necessarily how they value the dead, but the things they value in death and in the afterlife and all that, I think, are very fascinating. Like, you know, the the idea of a journey through un- to the afterlife and like the perils that you have to fight through that, the idea that, you know, the orienting towards Mecca. You know, all of those things are, are fascinating and they tell you so much about what they value and find important as like a last rights type of thing for those folks who are moving on. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's a great closing take home point. Do you have any others? Nope, that's that was the main one. All right, then let's go ahead and move to some recommendations. Recommendations. My recommendation this week has to do with the episode. You know, one thing that I have talked about, I'm not I'm not a big fan of talking about death in my own life and like struggling with that. I think my dad didn't tell us until later that he wanted to be shot into the sun and then he wouldn't tell anybody else what he wanted to do. So we were like, you got to tell us something. So we've been having those conversations. And for me, I have elected to become a coral reef. So the idea is that they would cremate my remains and they would form kind of a, a reef ball there's a website called eternalreefs.com. Cool. Yeah. Eternalreefs.com. And what they do is they create these reef balls, which are like, they kind of look like, um, like this ball. It's got like these, it's like porous. It's got these holes in it. It's like this concrete ball and they just drop it into a group of other reef balls and let coral reefs just kind of develop all over them. And you can find this kind of all over the coastlines where there are like coral reefs that they're trying to rebuild. And that's what I have elected to do in my life. So I just thought it was kind of a fascinating way to kind of, you know, again, it's not as green as it could be, but the idea is that it is kind of like helping with the spaces that, you know, are on the planet that need a little bit of help. So So your recommendation is to become a coral reef. Yeah. My recommendation is to become a coral reef. If you can, (laughs) I I love that. Actually, I think that's really cool. I also do think that eternal reefs is a good band name. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this a little bit on on one of the videos in preparation for this they showed. And so if you look up, there's videos of the human remains being turned into coral reef. It's kind of beautiful. You know, it's it's a really neat idea. So I totally appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I'm also of the mindset that I don't like to be a burden on anybody. And I feel like if you buried me somewhere, someone would have to, would have to come and visit me and clean my tombstone. And I just feel like I'm a burden after like I'm already enough of a burden in life after life. I don't want to be a burden too. So yeah, don't bury me. I would, I would hate that. And don't cremate me and carry my ashes around. Cause it's another thing you have to move when you move out. Yeah. Yeah. The urns and whatnot. Yeah. I'm going to go a completely different direction. This is unrelated <laughs> to anything that we've talked about. I'm going to recommend a movie that I saw recently. Now this came out in 2020 so it's not super recent but it's called promising young woman and i don't want to give away the conceit of this too much it's kind of a thriller but what i will say is this first of all the directing the casting and the acting and the score are super super good nice so there's those qualities of the movie the plot is just like it hums along at such a good pace and it's not super long it's it's less than two hours you just follow this sort of character study and someone who is clearly going through some stuff. Uh You sort of start to understand an event that happened to her and how she's dealing with that. And she's a very cool hero, sort of anti-hero, mostly hero throughout the movie. So a a female led movie. And I believe this was nominated for, and maybe won an Academy award. But I really, really enjoyed it. I, I strongly recommend it. It's currently available on HBO, or at least I think, I think it is. But yeah, this is one worth checking out. It is not for kids, <laughs> but it, it is a, an enjoyable movie. And not safe for work. <laughs> not safe for work. Probably not. <laughs> no, definitely a lot of swearing and some amounts of small amounts of nudity and 
whatnot. So, all right. Okay. We're going to wrap up our Halloween spooky month series. We're going to bury this Halloween series of episodes and then maybe we'll resurrect it next year or we'll, we'll, we'll dig a new hole for the next one. (laughs) Okay. If we missed any tradition you would like to tell us about, we'd really enjoy hearing about that. If you would like to recommend a movie or a way that you'd like to have your remains dealt with, that would be also fantastic. I definitely want to say thank you to a certain amount of people who really helped make this podcast happen without whom we would also be dead and buried. Mm -hmm. And those people are Amanda, Justin, Justine, Layla, Megan, Mike M, Mike T, and Shauna. Thank you so much for my team. Thank you, Shane, for recording with me today. Anytime. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Selena, Kyle, Allen, and Justin, who does our, our music and audio stuff. I appreciate everyone. And uh, oh, as I was saying, that you can reach us and tell us about uh, your your burial practices or or thing that you want to do for yourself. You can reach us at info at www.wwdpodcast dot com. You can reach us on any of the social media platforms, and we will respond to you in some capacity. If you are not a bot or a thing looking to exploit us, yeah, so exactly. If you're neither of those things, then then please reach us, and we'll be happy to read and respond to your message. One hundred percent. I think that's all I have. Anything more for you? Nope, that's all I got. All right, this is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. Why We Do What We Do is supported in part by our amazing patrons. Thank you. If you like what you heard, consider becoming a patron by heading to patreon.com slash podcast. You can also rate and review us wherever you get your podcast or share this episode with your friends. If you have any comments or questions, we'd love to hear from you. Find us at WWD Podcast on your favorite social media platforms. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. There you'll find links as well as detailed and shareable show notes. Why We Do What We Do is researched and produced by Abraham, Ryan O, Shane, and Miranda. Artwork and logo design by Andrew Pollock at nogdesigns.com. Video and production assistance from Tyler Brassier with music courtesy of Justin Greenhouse. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.